Joining us now is our panel, News Corp columnist Angela Mollard and news.com.au entertainment reporter Bronte Coy. Ladies, fabulous as always to have you back. Now, Angela, given it is Prince George's birthday yesterday and, and we have been focusing on the future of the royal family and the Commonwealth, what's your view on the approach that uh, William and Kate have taken with Prince George? Do you think it's sensible? Oh, I think it's very sensible. Look, we understand that he knows he is going to be uh, king. He was told when he was around seven years old. But the focus uh, for Kate and William is prolonging his childhood rather than preparing him for the crown. And to that end, look, I think there's some interesting factors here. Number one is that Ch uh, Kate works in, in early childhood education. That's one of her legacy projects. She will have consulted a psychologist about how to tell... Uh, George about becoming king, how he will become king, and about what responsibility uh, she, the, the, the couple give to him. Secondly, I think the, the it's family first with this at this family and. Everything that uh, George goes to, he usually has his brother and sister alongside him. A couple of things just with his parents, but mostly Charlotte's there. So it's all about family first. This is not about heirs and, heirs and spares. This is about a family. And thirdly, the other main point is to not sort of show too much or to give away too much about what his life is going to be like at this early stage and to enjoy this childhood is, of course, because he's going to have a full adult life in all likelihood before he does become monarch. He could be 50 or 60 before he becomes king. So he is likely to have a job, a family, all that sort of thing before he becomes king. Bronte, I think that's um, that's a, a, a pretty a great observation, actually. But I really get the impression that William and Kate, they balance protecting their children without being grossly over, overbearing. And I think um, that's quite an achievement given their parenting circumstances. Oh, absolutely. What a challenge it is to raise a child anyway, let alone one that really needs to be a decent human being and also is going to have the spotlight of the world on him. Already he does and he will have for the rest of his life. But it does seem that Kate and William are really taking a different approach in raising this heir to the throne than any we've seen before. I mean, a great example, and Angela's mentioned a bunch of them just then, but a great example is them even just moving out of uh, out of London and to Windsor. And it means that they've got that lifestyle where the kids actually run around outside. They have an outdoorsy uh, normal childhood, as normal as it can be, without the glare of the public on them. And, you know, we also... We see so many pictures of the kids, but the truth is we actually don't see them that often. And when we do, it's in circumstances that are so carefully controlled by their parents, uh, which is an incredible feat from Kate and William. I, think about, we've seen them at Will, Wimbledon recently. We saw them uh, We saw them during the coronation. But outside that, they're sort of left alone to go to school and just enjoy their childhood. So I think that Kate and William are taking that approach very deliberately, very carefully. And I think William also uh, probably wants a very different childhood for his son than what he had. And Angela, I understand the Middletons are very involved in the children's lives, aren't they? That's right. So, it, it, I mean, William absolutely loves the Middletons. I think at times he calls Michael Middleton dad. And of course, he's been in their life for many years, 20 years now. Uh, so and he wants that for their children. So while the Middletons will go with them on holidays, they're about to obviously start the summer holidays in the UK. They go to Mustique. They go to the Scilly Islands. They go up to Norfolk and the Middletons accompany them. When they were sailing on the Isle of Wight, that picture there, there's Michael Middleton. Just look at his stance. He's so relaxed and George looks so relaxed. I mean, this is this is your alternative family to the royal family. I mean, Carol every year organises a tree specifically for the Wales children to decorate it so that, you know, the one obviously at Sandringham is done by the staff in all likelihood. So she makes sure that there's a tree just for them. And there's a funny story from when um, George was very little, about four or five, and he was out walking with Carol and a passerby said to him, what's your name? Um, as she was walking a dog, he patted the dog and for some reason, George said, his name was Archie. No one could give an explanation for why that was, but Carol was the one with him and apparently laughed at the time and asked the passerby to please not take a photo of, of him or mention it. So very involved and very trusted, more to the point. Yeah, which is fabulous. Bronte, it's been reported that Kate's only official portrait is collecting dust in storage. Why is that? 
Yeah, this is an interesting one. So this portrait was first unveiled about 10 years ago when Kate was around 31. Uh, it's an interesting picture. It was a little divisive at the time. For someone who is objectively absolutely stunning, I would suggest maybe not the most flattering likeness. Uh, at the time, I will say that Kate apparently said it was brilliant and amazing, but the members of the public that saw it didn't reflect that generally. Uh, so what's happened is in recent years, the National Portrait Gallery where it's housed has undergone a large refurbishment and Kate is the patron of that gallery. It's reopened and suddenly the picture is no longer on display, which if she did have a hand in is the most relatable <laughs> thing I've ever heard. Uh, so it's being held in a storeroom and you can see it, but it's by private invitation only. Uh, and look, I'm not saying we don't know if she had a specific role in it. But after looking at the picture, I'd say we can't rule it out. <laughs> Angela, it's also been reported uh, that the birth of King jo of Prince George, since we're talking about George, was the beginning of the end of William and Harry. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it's true. There's a, there's a piece out today saying that's the case. And certainly if you go back as far as 2016, uh, so seven years ago, Harry gave an interview to The Times where he said he had a limited amount of time to stay relevant. And actually, this is the quote he gave to The Times, which at the, at the time I thought was quite uh, insightful. He said, I'm in this, I'm in, if I'm in, if I'm in this privileged position and I will use it for as long as I can or until I become boring or until George ends up becoming more interesting. So he's got a real chip on his shoulder about this heir who's let frog you know, over him. You know, he had started off with uh, Kate and William wanting to be really involved in George's life. But even as, you know, as early as 2016, he was almost in competition with this young boy. And, you know, there's plenty of work to be done for the royal family. You know, Harry obviously had the Invictus Games. We loved Harry. Harry could have done anything for the rest of his life and been loved and adored and purposeful and admired. But it's his choice and his chip on his shoulder. And if you're going to be scared about a baby boy, then and that's your problem. Yeah, here, here. Angela, I'll stick with you. Um, Harry and Megan, uh, they, we continue to hear these stories about them trying to get close to A-listers, but how successful have they been? Well, not at all. I mean, you never see them with anybody. Nobody endorses them. Nobody talks about them. In fact, they're shunned, aren't they? Christian Dior wanted to distance themselves. Um, um, Spotify, of course, have broken that deal and called them grifters. We hear that they're trying to move into Malibu or they're certainly looking at property in that area. Montecito, of course, being, a, you know, in rush hour, a two to three hour drive from all the action. I mean, they want to apparently move to Malibu where Megan spent some of her childhood growing up. I mean, Leo. DiCaprio, Leo DiCaprio, uh, Lady Gaga, people like that live there. But with, of course, Meghan signing with the William Morris Agency, proximity to movers and shakers, and, of course, the lifestyle. If she's going to go back into being a lifestyle blogger, which I can fully see that she might, um, it's about you know, not being as far out as they are. And, you know, family life has a limited appeal in terms of content. She's going to be wanting to recommend restaurants. And, you know, as the TIG did her previous uh, blog, it was all about wine and food and fashion. So it'll be interesting to see where they go in the next few months. Yeah, absolutely, it will. Look, ladies, that's all that we've got time for uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Angela Mollard-Bronte-Coy. Thank you for joining us.